That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons a podcast shall rise. H.P. Lovecraft, Weird Tales, Ramsey Campbell, Cthulhu, Laird Baron, Silent Hill, Brian Lumley, Dagon. There's something sinister out there in the cosmos, and the tendrils run deep throughout the universe. Only one woman dares to traverse the web. Mary San Giovanni, who once again is up to cosmic shenanigans. Hi folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. This is Mary San Giovanni, and as always... I am up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions. Today, I am pretty excited to talk about a short story by John Langan, which I think is an absolutely uh, brilliant evolution, I think, of cosmic horror in its own way. And uh, strangely enough, not one that I think that um, maybe even John necessarily considers cosmic horror, but I think has definitive elements uh, of a cosmic horror short story. It's called Episode 7, Last Stand Against the Pack in the Kingdom of the Purple Flowers. Now, I did some research, and it looks like this story is more or less exclusive to John's collection, Mr. Gaunt and other uneasy encounters. Although I have seen some um, references on the internet that the story was originally published in 2007. In John's story notes in Mr. Gaunt and other uneasy encounters, he uh, mentions that it's almost a collaboration with himself of 20 years ago and that it was uh, more or less influenced by a story by Dale Bailey and by uh, a lot of other post-apocalyptic fiction that he's read over, you know, the last 20 or 30 years. And I think it's sort of interesting that in, in his story notes, he doesn't mention cosmic horror at all, but rather a variety of post-apocalyptic inspirations instead. Um, where I think that, you know, uh, that some of John's work is known for being post-apocalyptic, uh, not all of it necessarily is, but I think this story dips its toe into it a little bit. And as I was rereading it, I think maybe more, it has more elements of cosmic horror than, uh, I think maybe one would at first su uh, suspect. For example, if we start with the very basic premise, we have a post apocalyptic world in which Jackie, who is about eight months pregnant, is uh fleeing a group of dog dog like entities they're kind of people dog type entities that she just calls the pack and she's fleeing this this group of of creatures uh whose origins we're not really sure of but we're going to come back to that uh with a friend Wayne and Wayne um is kind of like that that basic best guy friend that you have. He's not the father of the baby. That would be Glenn who's been murdered. Um, but he is absolutely devoted to protecting her and to protecting her unborn baby. Uh, now what I think is interesting about the setup of this world, if we look at what John says as their discussion re re uh, regarding what may have happened, um, Basically, it's, it says she and Wayne had diverted themselves by inventing explanations for what had befallen the world. So no one's quite sure what is going on here. Um, quote, the more fanciful, the better. God had decided that the apocalypse proposed in Revelation wasn't sufficiently au courant. And so had pi pillaged paperback thrillers for something with more panache. Monsters had broken through from the other side of the mirror, Alice's looking glass land on acid. This world had intersected some other dimension, another earth or even series of earths, each of them radically different, and everything had become tangled. Now, see, I kind of like, um, I, I kind of like that idea in, in explaining, however briefly, uh, about what is happening in this world, which is uh, essentially... Uh, a, a plague 
which melts people's faces off, uh, has befallen most of the human race and, and taken out most of the human race. And in addition are the appearance of these, of these dog-like creatures, the pack, um, that, that tend to hunt, I guess, the, the survivors down. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there's a couple of things here that I think which, which really have cosmic horror elements as well as post-apocalyptic. And I was giving this some thought. Not all post-apocalyptic fiction is cosmic horror, but one thing they do share in common, I think, is that sort of pervasive idea that all of human accomplishment, that the sum total, the pinnacle of everything that people are capable of uh, having accomplished or achieved in the you know, thousands of years we've been on this planet, that it could essentially be wiped out by indifferent forces. Now, whether those indifferent forces are the results of a nuclear bomb or uh, a pandemic plague or uh, you know, natural disasters of some other type, uh, the, the, you know, solar flares or a meteor hitting the planet, whatever the case is, is that these huge, Indifferent forces, bigger than any one person, bigger almost than we can conceive in terms of their absolute destructive power, have rendered the human race and all of its achievements essentially uh, useless, essentially at sort of a, a moot point. And that this force, whatever it is, is indifferent and inexorable. We can't avoid it. We can't avoid the results of it. It has irrevocably changed our world. There are some other elements too. I think the fact that uh, the the plague, um, in this particular case, that this plague seems to be the the primary large cosmic uh, entity, for lack of a better way to say it, that has uh, wreaked so much havoc upon the world and possibly caused maybe the mutation of or. Uh, has somehow allowed for the presence of these these beings, whatever the pack is actually um, made up of. Now, in the story, uh, Jackie does speculate from time to time about whether or not the pack are uh, sentient, whether or not they're smart enough to reason and to think. In some cases, they seem to be, and in others, they seem to be driven purely by desperation. Uh, the way hungry wolves might be. Um, there aren't very many humans left to feed on, and yet they seem to be going against the animal instinct of uh, continuing to pursue dangerous prey uh, in, in lieu of something easier to kill uh, because they, they keep after the characters. It's almost as if there is a vengeance there. It's almost as if there is uh, a sense of understanding of the nuances like um, taunting, or uh, the setting up of traps. They're not clearly and overtly sentient, but there is something that seems to distinguish them from mere animals. And this seems to bother Jackie more so than if they were just wild, feral things. Um, now, the suggestion could be, although it's never stated, that maybe they once were people, and this is something that happens to a... Uh, segment of the population who has contracted the plague, instead of having their faces melted off, they mutate. Or, um, I, and I think what, I think what bothers her about it is that idea that if they're sentient and they're just trying to survive, how are they any different maybe than Jackie and Wayne? And, uh, and, and so I think that bothers her because what, what we get here, I think is, um, an arguably cosmic horror notion that the human race is not the most important, that it has, it has no more right to survive or right to life than other things, other possibly sentient beings who are trying just as hard to survive as well. And I think that makes her very uncomfortable um, in the story. Now we have a, uh, also, uh, a sense of uh, the, the purple flowers uh, uh, that are referenced in the title throughout the story. And this is, again, I think maybe one of the most tangible 
perhaps one of the the most um, physical ties to cosmic horror is that throughout their journey across the countryside, and they've been running, I, I believe, for about a month, uh, they keep coming across carfuls of purple flowers. That these purple flowers entwine themselves throughout the the structures, the actual structures of vehicles, and and, and she, you know, she she ruminates about the idea that uh, these flowers seem to be growing without any source of food or water. They're not coming out of the ground, but they're actually growing out of only cars and trucks and vehicles like that, um, and that they they give off this purple pollen, which. Again, although Julie isn't sure why, she happens to get a face full of it. And Wayne yanks her out of the way. He yanks her out of the to protect her from inhaling too much of this stuff. And we're left to wonder as readers whether or not Wayne is aware or just being particularly cautious of the potential effects that this this alien purple flower may have and, and its pollen may have on the human reproductive system, particularly of a woman who is this far along pregnant. Um, I think that this is a, 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 a cosmic horror element because what we see, basically, is the intrusion of alien life into something that is, is our own world, something that shouldn't be particularly threatening, but as the title suggests, has... Um, this connotation of whatever this whatever this force is that has so drastically changed the world, it is now the realm of that force. It is now the kingdom of that force. It's not our planet anymore. It's the kingdom of the purple flowers now. That uh, what we had, what we knew, is gone and has been replaced by whatever cosmic force has brought the plague and the pack and the and these. It's even brought its own flora. It's brought its own purple flowers, which feed apparently on the mechanisms of vehicles rather than the ground. Uh, another element in this that I think is somewhat cosmic horror-ish is the very um, sense of, of Jackie's pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy in stories is uh, most obviously a symbolic of of the cycle of life and death and renewal of life and, and, and this continuation of life, um, which generally I think cosmic horror works against, but we've got a woman who is very much experiencing. Um, I wouldn't say it's an unwanted pregnancy. She wants this baby. She wants this baby to be okay. And we're going to come back to why, um, but it was not a planned pregnancy. It was not an expected pregnancy. Um, her, her getting pregnant, you know, by its very nature, okay, um, in, in Lovecraft stories, pregnant women were simply vessels for uh, the cosmic horror entity to um, mix with the human race, that, that pregnancy was a, a doorway through which uh, other, other cosmic forces could enter our world. But... Uh, and also the pregnancy um, is, a, is a profound, fundamental change of the body, the mind. It's the altering of the very stu- substance of a woman chemically, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, that there's very much a sense of transcendence and transformation when a woman is pregnant. And that women kind of go with the flow with it, I think is, is part of, is part of the, the, the cosmic, el- you know, cosmic horror element, I think, of this, of this transcendence that they accept a, an, an absolute change, an absolute, in many ways, uh, acquiescence to, uh, the, the being growing inside them. Um, and, and this is true, I think, of Jackie. She wants this baby to be okay. Because I think as many, many women who are pregnant can attest, uh, there's an, often an instant bonding with the baby growing inside of you 
Um, even though you've never met the baby, you don't know anything about the baby, even though for months you don't even feel the baby as anything other than a series of physical symptoms. But when the baby starts kicking, it's, I think, a wake-up call that there's an actual real human being inside of uh, of your body and that you are, in essence, a vessel, a, a protective vessel for this little person that you would instantly die for in order to protect. That is a fundamental, and as I said, a profound change in both your, your physical and your mental and emotional um, makeup, really. And I think a lot of cosmic horror highlights that uh, for the purpose of showing that even our bodies at some point are not our own. And what is interesting about um, I, I think with Lovecraft, it was more of a, uh, unwilling, uh, uh, losing yourself unwillingly to the other. Uh, I think with pregnancy though, I think one of the things that Lovecraft overlooked, even in his own work, is that oftentimes mothers will accept certain variants and certain, um, you know, differences for the sake of that, that, that kind of transformation, which makes uh, women often feel, I think, to an extent, uh, a, 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 an instrument of something greater than themselves. In this particular story, despite all of that, uh, Jackie is at a distinct disadvantage. I mean, because with pregnancy, there is a lot of discomfort. There is a, a limitation to mobility there are um, aches and pains you can't explain. And a lot of times, once you get to that, you know, seven, eight, nine month mark, um, nothing is bad news. Uh, no kicking, no um, roiling around. You know, if the baby's not moving, it is a cause for concern. Because then again, you, you know, again, you, you worry whether you have reason to or not. Um, if you're carrying life with you or if you're carrying death. And I think that element, you know, plays into this particular story in that even being this instrument of creation, you have no real control over it. That even in the most, uh, the, the most elevated, perhaps in some ways that a woman could feel in terms of being close to something godlike in, in, in this ability to, to create and to carry life within you that you still have little, little to no control over it. Uh, we have the essence of, uh, comic book superheroes in this. Wayne is very much a comic book superhero. Um, probably leans more t toward DC than, uh, Marvel. He's a big Batman fan. In fact, uh, John Langan says that his shirt has a Batman emblem on the front. Uh, and his very name, Wayne, could be a, a nod to the fact that Batman's alter ego, his real name was Bruce Wayne. Now, what I find interesting about this particular choice is that throughout the story, and this is going to come back again when we talk about the last element of cosmic horror for this particular story, uh, what we have is... Uh, a transformation in Wayne as well, who was the quiet, soft-spoken, um, academic type, maybe the intellectual type, the type that, uh, could argue a blue streak, I think, about, uh, say the, the nature of the new 52, but maybe wasn't so much the, the MacGyver type, the, the rugged physical hero type. And, I think this is interesting because uh, the transformation that we're seeing here is uh, Batman's uh, Batman is Wayne's uh, transformation to a kind of Batman like character. Um, Batman in the comics, so far as I know, and at least in, in the depictions of the comics that I have seen, uh, is driven by obsession. So much so that there is some question, not so much in, in his, in his, uh, moral 
standing, but in his motive. Um, he's called the Dark Knight for a reason. That there is an essence of vengeance as much, if not more, than justice. And, and that there's a, a dark side to the character because obsession, uh, eventually blots out the cause. If you want to be a hero and you want to save lives, uh, for example, you, uh, you eventually start with the moral code you're given. But obsession has a way, much like the, the natural element of cosmic horror in, in that transformation is change over time, um, which becomes itself. It becomes uh, a, a different thing. It is, it is a recoding of what you think of yourself, what you think of others around you, what you think of the world around you. And obsession does that. It changes your underlying, it maybe doesn't change why you do what you do, but it changes how you do what you do. Uh, because where a goal like, say, saving, saving other people, being a hero, is a noble goal, um, what you do to accomplish that goal uh, is more driven by obsession than by the same moral code that wants you to save other people in the first place. And that's what I think that Jackie is seeing with Wayne is an almost gleefully violent streak, if not an, a, a shutting off of the, the, the societal mores that uh, people are uh, born or raised with, basically. They're not really born with them. They're raised with them. That violence, that um, fighting dirty, perhaps, is uh, that these things are not noble pursuits, even um, that they're, they are not means that justify the end. And, uh, and Wayne, if, in, in, the, um, in this transformation, is looking to survive. Uh, so he is, in essence, uh, following the same origin story as, say, somebody like Batman. He watched his parents murdered by the pack uh, and is essentially driven by rage as much as a need to protect Jackie. And that um, perhaps the intermingling of his motives um, is becoming an obsession. That the the violence with which he employs certain traps and and certain uh, evasive maneuvers is perhaps overshadowing the um, the good heart that it was originally behind. Uh, that was the driving force behind these things to begin with. Now, this is sort of personified by what I think of as the, the last element of cosmic horror uh, in this story, and that's what I've come to think of as the Black Shroud. Um, John Langan doesn't explain what it is exactly, and he never explains uh, where it came from or even if Wayne is aware of it. But to Jackie, uh, Wayne is changing, as I, as I mentioned, that this change, this transcendence is manifesting itself as almost a physical cape and cowl like uh like Batman wears that it covers part of his face at times that it it trails behind him like this black cape and it is a force if we are to look at it as something sentient and it may or may not be but it is a force that is indifferent it is using Wayne to achieve uh, a particular end and in that quest to achieve, uh, to achieve whatever this particular end is, it is serving as both savior to them and a potential threat. W what we see up until, uh, up until the end, more or less, is, is Wayne using ingenuity. Um, he's not particularly strong. He's described as being very tall and kind of gangly and thin, um, but very smart. And, and I think very quick thinking. Uh, and he, he devises these traps, these various traps that are eliminating piece by piece uh, members of this pack and, and whittling them down. But there's no display of overt hand-to-hand -hand combat strength here because 
these things, the, the, these creatures in the pack are physically uh, overpowering. They're much bigger, much stronger, much more savage. Until the end, when the little glimpses of this black shroud, whatever it is, this cape and cowl that seems to be following Wayne, um, actually seem to take over. And Wayne is, is able to exhibit a feat of strength in dispatching the leader of this pack that um, should not have been capable, well, he, as a human being, he probably should not have been capable of doing this. As a person, the, the personality described to us, he should not have been capable of such an act of violence. And yet he is. And he never discusses it with her. What I think is interesting is that instinctively, on a gut level, and I think that many pregnant women would agree that particularly when you're pregnant, but all through your life as a woman, but particularly when you're pregnant, um, your gut instinct is the most reliable source of control over your changing circumstances that you have. Doctors will tell you that. Nurses will tell you that. Even once the baby's born, go with your gut. If you're cold, the baby's cold. If you're hot, the baby's hot. If you're tired, the baby's tired. Um, whatever you feel, if something feels right, go with it. If you have a craving for something, go with it. If something feels wrong, don't do it. Trust your gut. And her gut, at this very pregnant juncture in her life, she is instinctively afraid of this black shroud, this this change in Wayne. So much so, she's threatened of it and afraid of it. So much so that she believes if she should bring it up even, let alone um, counter its existence or or try to, to convince Wayne in some way to let go of this piece, if he's even aware that it exists, that Wayne would choose this over her. And part of that, again, it, it goes back to gut instinct, that one of the things I think, uh, one of the elements of cosmic horror, particularly related to the idea of change, is that sometimes a change takes hold of you which in some ways gives you gives you a, a new lease on life that you never had. It gives you options for n- n- new strengths, new powers, new vistas of information. And the pursuit of that or the cultivation of that becomes an obsession in and of itself. And instead of uh, pursuing, say, a betterment of yourself, you pursue this feeling of power, this feeling of uh, vengeance, this feeling of control um, at the detriment to the person um, that was holding it all up to begin with. And I, I think that's what she's afraid of, that Wayne, who was never the leading man, is now um, kind of a superhero, kind of an action hero, in how he is is taking care of her and protecting her. And that even for her, uh, he may not be willing to give that up. Or worse, that whatever this thing is, may not be willing to give him up. And then that would leave her and her baby even more helpless than they are now. Um, And what I think it says, again, in a cosmic horror sense, is that in the end, we have no choice but to accept the change around us. That we are helpless not to change with it. And that ultimately uh, we are at the mercy of whatever the force of change is. And again, I think this is both something that is prevalent in post-apocalyptic fiction and in cosmic horror fiction, because there is that overlap of uh, the, the, I guess the end of, the human civilization as we know it. The difference, I think, is that one of the um, one of the attempts of a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction is to show the resiliency of the human race, the resourcefulness, uh, that survival instinct that kicks in when nothing else can get in its way. Whereas in cosmic horror, and I think in this particular story, we have the element of uh, helplessness in this situation that even survival 
is still something that we are giving up in order to achieve, that we are still, no matter how resourceful or uh, how powerful or how in control we come across in a situation, that there are still forces on our shoulder, forces above and beyond us, bigger than we can imagine perhaps, forces from possibly some other cosmic dimension that are still pulling the strings every step of the way. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans and want to uh, listen to past episodes or future episodes, you can go to Brian Keen Radio on the briankeen.com website. Click on Cosmic Shenanigans. Um, you can find Cosmic Shenanigans any place where podcasts are sold and broadcast, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, the whole nine yards. So check those out. Uh, thank you to my engineer, Matt Wildeson. Go check his books out. He's got some new stuff out this, uh, this month that you really should, you really should pick up because he has a lot of cool cosmic horror stuff in, uh, his short, short story collections. And I will talk to you next week. Okay. Bye. Cosmic Shenanigans. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Cosmic Shenanigans is written and produced by Mary San Giovanni. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com.